Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donna Osier, and I'm the Executive Director of the Macular Degeneration Association. And we're glad that you are joining us today for a wonderful talk on decoding dry eye, understanding how our eyes work to empower, empower us. At this time, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Berzik. He is um, FAAO certified. Dr. Berzik is on the Macular Degeneration Association's medical board. Dr. Berzik graduated from the New England College of Optometry in 2002. He practices full scope optometry with an emphasis on ocular disease management of the anterior segment contact lenses, and glaucoma. Dr. Berzik is on, is on the editorial board of a number of optometric publications. He has published over 200 articles and has given over a thousand lectures, both nationally and internationally on contemporary topics in eye care. He is a member of the American Optometric Association and the American Academy of Optometry. He enjoys spending time with his wife, Sonia, and daughter Zoe and Ava. He practices with the Premier, Premier Vision Group. I'd like to introduce Dr. Berzik, and he'll be talking about decoding dry eye, understanding how our eyes work to empower, empower us. Dr. Berzik? Donna, thank you for the gracious introduction and welcome all of you um, on the webinar today. So first and foremost, just to make sure that we get a little bit of the housekeeping out of the way here. Um, Every one of you will have a question and answer tab or box. The reason why I point that out is I want to make sure that every single one of you know that as we go through this discussion, this is really your opportunity to ask questions as we go through the material. Because as we go through this, although I'm going to make it as practical as possible, and I think that everybody's just going to, by the end of this, going to understand the way that the eyes work a little bit more so and just have a better understanding around dry eye and some of the new contemporary ways that we are even helping individuals with dry eye disease. I think that the more knowledge that everybody has about the conditions that can potentially affect them, the better armed and equipped they are to have those good, deep, thick conversations with the clinicians that are caring for them or the doctors that are caring for them. With that said, what I don't want you to feel like is I have to wait till the end of the discussion to ask these questions. So if I'm going through anything and you have any questions about anything, you type your question in the chat box and I'll make sure that I'm constantly monitoring that. So we're addressing those questions as we go through the discussion. Now, um, Donna, again, thank you for the gracious introduction. I've had the good fortune to be involved in a lot in optometry, although today, I'm in my office, and like Donna said, I'm a partner of Premier Vision Group, which is a four-location practice in Northwest Ohio. Um, I'm currently in our Bowling Green office, which is where I spend most of my time. Um, but I have, and I do work a lot with companies um, within the eye care space, really um, working with them in a several capacities. One is research, consulting, acting in an advisory capacity or performing speaking events for those companies. But saying that, the place where I really enjoy spending my time is looking to the next phase or the next step of eye care and what we currently have now and how we're looking in the future to potentially develop better, more adequate, more advanced technologies to help a lot of the patients that we're caring for um, now and make the care for those individuals better. So I think it's important whenever you hear anybody talking about any topic, I think it's critically important to understand why somebody has a passion for a certain topic. And I'll share with you exactly why I became so passionate with dry eye or what will sometimes be referred to as ocular surface disease. You may have heard it called that before. If you have, when you think of dry eye disease and ocular surface disease, for lack of a better way to describe it, think of those two things as synony synonymous with one another or the same thing, essentially. So I was, I'm currently graduated in 2002. So this is my 21st year in clinical practice. And when I had graduated three years after optometry school, or after I graduated optometry school, I became a partner in the practice. And I had a first time patient come into the office 
She was a 42-year-old female who I used to describe as an older 42-year-old female. I'm 47 now, so I describe her as this young, hip 42-year-old female. But she came in and her chief complaint was, I can't see up close through my glasses anymore. Well, she now needed a bifocal through her, in her glasses. And we're fortunate that we have different ways to put bifocal lenses in glasses. And one of the most advanced ways to do that, even today still, is with a progressive lens or a no-line bifocal. So it slowly progresses from the top with your distance power, and it goes to the bottom where you have your near power located. And some of you may be wearing progressive edition lenses, and some of you may know exactly some of the benefits and the challenges with this design. Well, I talked to her about it, described everything to her, and she was back on my schedule one month later for a prescription check. And I asked one of the head technicians at the time, I said, Mary, what, why is she back on my schedule for, for, for a vision check? And she said, Dr. B, she says she can't see anything out of her new glasses. I said, interesting. So I get her back in the exam room and measure the prescription. Everything's measuring perfectly. But what I realized was that day I missed one thing on this individual. She had an underlying dry eye disease that was causing her the inability to focus in her glasses. This is how she was reading the eye chart for me when I tested her vision. She covered up one of her eyes. And for those of you that have had your eyes examined, you know, this is a very common test. So you cover up your eye and we ask you to read the lowest line of letters that you think you can. And sometimes we even isolate those letters and make them smaller and smaller. Well, this particular woman, she could see the smallest row, but she was doing this. She had to blink to clear things up and she could see, but then she has to blink again to clear things up. Now, why would somebody with dry eye need to blink to clear things up temporarily? Well, when we're thinking about the tear film, realize that the tear film is there on the surface of the eye and it's present there for one of two functions. First, it protects the surface of the eye because without the tear film, your cornea, which is the clear structure that the tears lie over, would literally completely haze up and you wouldn't be able to see out at the world. So what it does is it protects the surface of the eye. And it's almost like a little layer of lubrication because we blink about every six to 10 seconds. We blink less frequently when we're on a computer screen. So we blink about once every 10 to 15 seconds when we're staring at a computer screen. So right now, I would urge you all to just look temporarily away from the computer screen and blink and look at something as best as you can, as far as you can. This recalibrates your eyes temporarily because what happens when we blink and when we stare, we're sweeping fresh tears over the eyes less frequently. And when we do that, we have less fresh tears sitting on the eyes. And when that happens, we have less of that oily protective layer. And when that occurs, what starts to happen, and the first thing that sometimes will start to happen is when you blink, your eyes feel less comfortable. And just like oil in, a, in an engine or in a piston makes it so that all the parts can move, and if you don't have oil in that same engine, it'll seize up or it'll stop moving, that's the way that the eyelid functions. So we want that nice thin layer of tears over the surface of the eye so that when we blink with the eyelid, we don't physically feel it. But the second thing that can happen with dryness is you can actually alter somebody's vision. Now, why would that happen? Well, the tear film is very, very thin, but it actually is supposed to be smooth. And we're not supposed to see any dry spots form in the tear film for at least eight to 10 seconds after we blink. Now, I'm gonna show you what this looks like at my special instrument here. It's called a slit lamp. And you're gonna see what this looks like here in a few moments. But what happens in an individual who has dry eye is they blink, they open their eyes, but instead of those dry spots forming about eight to 10 seconds after the eye opens up, they start forming much, much quicker, sometimes as soon as two to three seconds. And if that happens, what you're now looking through is not a smooth tear film. You're actually looking through a tear film that's lumpy, and when you look through a tear film that's lumpy and light hits it, 
light scatters. And when light scatters, the way that you perceive that scattered light is things look fuzzy, things look blurry. So what sometimes people will do to clear it up is they close their eyes and they rub their eyes like this. And hopefully everybody can see my video so they can see what I'm doing right now. But they literally rub their eyes like this. And when they do that, they don't know that they're doing it, but they're trying to sweep that fresh layer of tears over the surface of the eyes. So the tear film has two functions. One is to protect the surface of the eye, because again, we're blinking over it every eight to 10 seconds. And also it's to make it so that that patient has a very consistent viewing sensation. Because if we didn't have a tear film, every time we blinked, our vision would be bad. Or if you have severe dry eye, every time you blink, you can have fluctuation in your vision. So as we regain a normal tear film, we start to stabilize the vision and we also start to make the eyes physically feel more comfortable. That to me was the first real case where I saw that somebody doesn't necessarily have to come in complaining about really, really sore eyes or burning or irritated eyes to be a dry eye patient. This was an individual who really didn't complain about the comfort of their eyes the first visit when they came in. That second visit, when I then asked them, do you feel like your eyes get tired, dry, irritated, itchy throughout the day? She looked at me and she said, well, yeah. I said, well, when does that happen? Like, is it more towards the end of the day? She goes, no, like after I get to work a few hours later, I start to notice that. But she didn't even think about bringing that up to me because I think personally, she probably thought that there wasn't any resolution. Now in 2005, we didn't have a lot of options for dry eye patients. So for those of you that are on the call that have had dry for a long period of time, you know that in 2005, we had artificial tears and there was one prescription medication that was available. We now have significantly more advancements to make eyes produce their own natural tears better. So why did I become passionate about dry eye? Well, I became passionate about dry eye because I saw how it could influence vision. But then I realized, my goodness, this is affecting our contact lens wearers too. Maybe if somebody's not wearing contact lenses comfortably, maybe it's nothing to do with the material that we're fitting the patient in. Maybe it has everything to do with how that person's producing tears on the surface of their eyes. And maybe if we're identifying these individuals early, we can get better outcomes with LASIK. And we can also get better outcomes with cataract surgery. Now, there are a few questions that are coming through. I'm going to answer those right now here. Can dry eye cause, I think what the, the question was, was infection of the eyes. Dry eye in and of itself doesn't cause infection of the eyes, but what it can do is it can increase your risk of developing an infection. And let me explain to you what I mean. Now, when I talk about these two terms that I'm gonna talk about right now, they sound very similar, but they're very, very different. Infection and inflammation are sometimes two terms that are interchangeably utilized, but they're two very different terms. An infection, which is what the question was asking me about, was when something gets into your system and actually breaks whatever barrier you have, and it starts now actively invading your body tissues. That's what an infection is. Inflammation is something where the tissues become warm and irritated. So as an example, an infection, let's say you have a bacteria and it invades an open cut that you have on your skin. It will cause inflammation from that infection. But just because you have inflammation doesn't mean you have infection. Let me give you a perfect example. I've never done a push-up in my life. Yesterday, I did 20 push-ups. Now my elbows are sore this morning. The reason why my elbows are sore is because of the inflammation that's occurring in my elbows. So I would take an ibuprofen or something like that to alleviate some of that inflammation that I have. So with an infection, you can get inflammation, but just because you have inflammation doesn't mean that you have an infection. 
So the reason why dry eye can increase your risk of developing an infection, because the tears are there to actually defend against bugs, viruses, fungus, and bacteria getting into your eyes. If you're deficient in that layer, you have more of a risk of a bug actually getting in and invading your eyes. Is dry eye the same as macular degeneration? Dry eye and macular degeneration are two very, very different things. Dry eye is happening on the very front of the eye. Macular degeneration is actually occurring way deep back on the inside of the eye. Now here's where it gets a little bit confusing and I wanna make sure we're crystal clear on this. There's a form of macular degeneration called dry macular degeneration. Again, that's where it can get confusing. Dry macular degeneration is not a type of dry eye. Dry eye, when we talk about dry eye, it's all happening on the very front surface of the eye. Macular degeneration is all happening on the back of the eye. So if anybody ever says macular de degeneration, it's all affecting the macula, which is on the very back surface of the inside of the eye. And dry macular degeneration is just one form of macular degeneration. There's another good question. How does dry eye affect epiretinal membranes? Interestingly, dry eye is a totally independent thing from epiretinal membranes. An epiretinal membrane actually occurs deep on the inside of the eye. And think of an epiretinal membrane as being something that is, so let me take a step back. Over everybody's macula and their retina, Remember, the macula is just a little part of the retina. So over the macula, everybody has a thin layer of clear tissue, and it has a very special name. It's called the internal limiting membrane. That clear tissue or that internal limiting membrane can sometimes can contract over the macula. And when that happens, it causes something called an epiretinal membrane. Now, the good news is that most epiretinal membranes are very, very mild, so they don't require, require any treatment. Saying that, if you have dry eye and it's affecting your vision, it may actually make the epiretinal membrane seem worse because now you have two things that may be affecting your vision. One is the epiretinal membrane and one is the dry eye. All right, guys, great questions here. Before we go on to the next slide, any other questions about dry eye and how it can affect your eyes and your vision? So I wanna give you a little different perspective on how the tear film works over the surface of the eye. Because again, it seems like this is just a little layer and it's very insignificant, but it's actually made of three specific layers. And what you're looking at right here is the very top layer of the tear film. This top layer of the tear film is the oily layer, and it's made by certain glands in your eyelids. This oily layer acts like the roof of the tear film, and it keeps all the other tears on the eyes and prevents them from evaporating off of the eyes. The second layer is the big layer of the tear film. And this is the aqueous layer or the watery layer of the tear film. This is what really keeps us defended against individuals. And this third layer of the tear film is called the mucin layer. And the mucin layer is literally the layer on the tear film that actually anchors the tear film to the surface of the eye. And all these small little extensions that you're seeing, they have a special name. They're on the surface of the corneal cells, but they're called little microvilli. So the reason why I share all of this with you is because I hope that this gives you a little bit of an understanding how a normal tear film looks, but look at how an abnormal tear film looks. Can you see these little, and you'll see them right here, see these little dark spots or dark regions or dark areas that are starting to form here? These are those dry spots that I was telling you about that form on the surface of the eye. And they form on the surface of the eye because there's dry spots that are forming in that tear film. And that's what can actually cause the eyes to get blurry with dry eye. All right, so there's several questions that came through as I was describing dry eye. So I'm gonna let this video play in the background as I answer these questions. So the first question came through, 
my eyes are tearing constantly. My doctor put me on eye drops. Why? So this is the interesting thing. Now, here's what I can't answer for you. I can't answer exactly why your doctor put you on drops. But what I can tell you is this. Sometimes one of the most, the chief complaint that somebody will come in who has dry eye is they'll complain about their eyes watering. Now, for most of you on the call, that might sound like I just took crazy pills and I'm sharing that with you. Because we're talking about dry eyes, we're talking about not being able to produce tears, but you're watering or your eyes are watering. So why does that happen? This is where the conversation gets really, really interesting. And I want everybody on the call to really understand what I'm describing here. Because if you understand this next component, you'll understand why dry eyes can cause your eyes to be watery. There's two types of tears that your eye produces. The first type of tear is that thin layer of tears that I was talking about, that more oily layer of tears. And it sits on the surface of your eye. And what it literally does is it's there so that we don't feel our eyes when we blink. And also so that we have a nice, consistent visual stimuli always going to the eye. So that's the first type of tears. And that first type of tear is produced in really, really low quantities. The second type of tear is actually released, and I hope you guys can all see my video, but it's released from the lacrimal gland, which is located right behind this bone. So when you touch your upper eyelid, you'll actually feel this orbital bone up here. Tucked right behind the orbital bone is the lacrimal gland. And that lacrimal gland, when it gets stimulated, your eyes will water. Well, why does the lacrimal gland get stimulated? If anybody's ever cried for emotional reasons, my my spouse or my boyfriend or my girlfriend said something mean to me and I'm emotional. I'm upset because of something that happened. I'm emotional, I start crying. The reason why you cry is because that gland gets activated and it literally releases maximum, a massive amount of fluid. What else happens or what else stimulates that? Well, if you ever get something in your eye, let's say for example, you, you get a little dust particle or a little hair or an eyelash in your eye. What starts to happen? Your eye starts watering like crazy. The reason why is because it's a defense mechanism to what's happened. The eye is literally trying to clear itself of whatever that offending agent is. And the way that it does that is to activate that second type of tear. So what I want you guys remembering when you leave this conversation today is we all have two types of tears. The first type of tear is that really thin layer that sits over the surface of the eye. And the second type of tear is that tear that gets released in response to some type of irritation. So now getting back to the actual question, why would somebody's eye water if they have dry eye? Well, if you think about it, if somebody's insufficiently producing that first type of tear, their eye is going to get irritated. They're going to start feeling like something's on the eye. And when they do that, the eye is naturally going to be going to respond by producing this second type of tear. And that second type of tear that gets released will actually be a massive flow. And that's why your eyes are watering. So again, we sometimes treat patients with watery eyes like a dry eye patient. And we'll sometimes give them medicated drops to help them produce their natural type one type tear better to try and avoid that second type of reflex tear from actually causing a lot of tearing. All right, a next question. I use Restasis for dry eyes for 20 years. How safe is it to use Restasis for long-term? Do you see any negative issues with long-term use of Restasis? What are the options for treatment of dry eye besides Restasis? Over-the-counter artificial tears aren't really helping me. Thank you. So if somebody is using Restasis, there's two other drops that are actually in the category of reducing inflammation. There's Restasis, there's Zydra, and there's also a drop called Sequa. All of those drops are safe to use over long periods of time. So that's, that's the answer to your first question. Now, the question might be, well, well, why do they work on dry eye patients? The reason why they work on dry eye patients is because they reduce inflammation. 
everybody that has dry eye has a certain level of inflammation on their eyes. And that's oftentimes what's causing the dry eye. So by reducing the inflammation, we know we can improve the dry eye. And that's really what these drops are actually using. So to answer your question, really, there's no, from what we can tell, there's no long-term side effects from restasis. And if you've been using it for 20 years, it was approved in 2003. So again, you've been really using it for as long as it's been available. Okay. Why am I unable to cry? Nothing comes out when I try to cry. So remember when I told you there's two types of tears. The first type of tear is the thin layer of tears that always resides on your eyes. The second type of tear is released from the lacrimal gland. If you have a difficult time crying or watering or your eyes watering, it's probably because you have a deficiency in that second type of tear. And that second type of tear is that more watery tear that's released from the lacrimal gland. Does age exacerbate dry eye? Yes, 100%. The number one risk factor for developing dry eye is aging. So I'm a 47 year old, but I would still consider to be a young, vibrant man, depending on whose eyes are looking and describing me. There are some that would describe me as an older gentleman at this point, but I'm 47 years old. I am 21 years older than the day I graduated optometry school. So just because I am 21 years older, I am more likely to have dry eye, either signs, symptoms, or both than I was 21 years ago. So age is the number one risk factor of developing dry eye. The second most common risk factor is being a female. Females are affected by dry eye more so than males at a rate of three to one. So for every single male that we see with dry eye, females are three times more likely to actually develop dry eye. Okay, does dry eye cause drusen? Ah, Here's where it starts getting a little bit confusing, and I want to make sure I'm crystal clear on this. And if you need further clarification, you just let me know. Um, drusen is something that's associated with macular degeneration. Okay. Remember, macular degeneration is at the back of the eye. Dry eye, or what we're talking about here, is all on the front surface of the eye. Now, with macular degeneration, remember we talked about dry forms of macular degeneration. There's also a wet form of macular degeneration. Even though we use those terms to describe the type of macular degeneration, none of this is happening or is associated with dry eye that's on the front of the eye. So again, whenever we're talking about macular degeneration, we're talking about the back of the eye. Now, you asked about drusen. Drusen is associated with the dry form of macular degeneration. The wet form of macular degeneration is when we actually see bleeding in the macula. Okay. Um, what do you think the value of the value of neurostimulation, IPL, Lipoflow, and ILUX? Um, those are all great questions. And I could share with you over the next afternoon. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, I'm in Eastern Standard Time. So anytime I reference time, I'll be referencing what time it is here, but right now we're about 1.05 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. What you just asked about was literally every single procedure that we can perform for dry eye. And the one thing that I would share with you, Alvin, is make sure that you're communicating directly one-on-one -on -one with your eye doctor. And the reason why I say that is because they're gonna be able to guide you on what the best treatment is for you, depending on what's the cause of the dryness. I'll give you a few examples. If somebody has meibomian gland dysfunction, which are the glands that are located inside of the eyelids that really aren't producing those oils as well as they're supposed to be. Lipoflow, Ilux, tear care. Those are three procedures that warm and evacuate the glands. They all work just a little bit differently, but each one of them could be used to do that and loosen those glands up. If you're simply not producing enough art tears, neurostimulation, for example, Tirvaya, which is a spray that you can put inside of your nose, 
or the I tier 100, which creates vibrations on the outside of the nose work great. If you have dry eye, that's secondary to rosacea, which is a reddening or an inflammation on the skin on the outside of the face. Sometimes people will have a secondary dry eye because of that. IPL or intense pulse light therapy may be the best treatment for that. So again, I really think the best option is honing in on what you and your doctor are thinking is the biggest cause for the dry eye signs and symptoms and really tailoring the treatment approach to attack that component first and then starting to layer onto other treatments. Does generic restasis work as well as restasis? It's cyclosporin. You know, that's an interesting question. And we've had um, some mixed results with that just personally in our own office. Some people, as soon as we've switched them from the branded product to the generic form of restasis, we've had some challenges. Other people, the transition has been smooth as silk. And I think that describes healthcare in general. Some of you on the call may actually be healthcare providers. Others may be people who are not healthcare providers. But one of the things that I was taught very early on in my career is that you can expose two people to the exact same circumstances and they'll respond a little bit differently. I want to repeat what I just said. You can expose two of the same people or two different people to the exact same set of circumstances and they re may respond to that set of circumstances differently or somewhat differently. And that holds true with generic restasis. Some people do very well and they can use it no problem. Other people have some challenges with it. What are the best brands of over-the-counter eye drops for dry eye? Are generics as good as national brands? These are expensive, thanks. So this is such a good, these have all been good questions, but this is such a good and worthwhile question to respond to because I know that that storefront shelf can be intimidating and it can be very, very aggressive. My first recommendation is always, 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 if there's ever any confusion or question, always ask your eye doctor about what's the best option or what they think is best for you because different artificial tiers have different components in them that are actually better or worse for different forms of dry eye. So there are certain artificial tears that I reach for when I see certain types of dry eye. And there are other artificial tears that I reach for when I see other types of artificial tears. The ones that I reach for most frequently are those that are preservative free. Now, Preservative free used to only be available in little unit dose vials. So unit dose vials are literally one-time use in this little kind of plastic vial, and then you throw it away. We now have preservative free bottles that are available. So again, keeps everything hygienic and sterile within the bottle, but it's safe to be preservative free. Now, when you ask about what I'm gonna to refer to as store brand products, because there truly are not generic artificial tears, even though we think it, even though the way that it's marketed and communicated to us on the store shelves as generic, they're not actually generic artificial tears. They're artificial tears that are different formulations placed with the retailer that you're at, the store that you're at, their generic label on it, but they're not the generic equivalents of the other artificial tears, and here's why. This is so critically important to know. Those store brand products or the ones that we typically refer to as generic, usually have something called benzoconium chloride in them. Benzoconium chloride is an aggressive preservative and that can actually make people's dry eye worse. So although you feel like my eyes are getting better, the more you use the store brand artificial tears, the worse it can potentially make your eyes. The second difference between these store brand products versus the name brand products of artificial tears is that they oftentimes have two components in them, nefazoline and tetrahydrazoline. Those are the two active ingredients in any drops that say it'll get the red out. Now, why is this important to understand? 
Well, what we've found now is that what we found now is that with these uh, store brand products, they now are putting these molecules in them without telling us that they're in them. So you have to be cautious of that. The third thing that's different is that even though the active ingredients look the same on the store brand artificial tiers versus the name brand artificial tiers, when you go to the inactive ingredients, they're totally, totally, totally different, which makes the name brand products work better than what's typically referred to as the generics. Some of you may be aware that there was an eye drop that was recently recalled because it was advertised as a preservative free bottle of artificial tears, but they didn't have the appropriate safety mechanisms in place. And because of that, it was a generic bottle. And because of that, it's been taken off the market because it was causing people to lose their sight. So again, just make sure you're communicating with your eye doctor on what's the best option for you, because there are a lot of options. But what I'm really gravitating towards are the preservative free options and the preservative free options in multi-dose bottles now. I have autoimmune disease lupus. Can this affect my eyes? It can. And autoimmune disease is one of the most common things we see associated with dry eye. And here's why. For those of you on the call that have autoimmune conditions, oftentimes you probably find yourself in a, in a frustrated place because you go to see your doctor, they give you something, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. And with autoimmunity, you oftentimes experience flaring of the symptoms that you experience. One of the other things that we see as a common attribute for people who have autoimmune conditions is, even though the example that was given was lupus, so it's a skin condition, there's oftentimes other things that are associated with it. And the reason why that is, is by the nature of the name of the condition, autoimmunity, you know that it's an immune response to the body. So because of that, usually it's not hyper specific for one part of the body. It actually interacts with several components of the body. So why did I say that autoimmunity is oftentimes associated with dry eye? The reason why that is, is because when you have this immune response to body cells, a lot of times there's cross reactivity. And that cross reactivity oftentimes is to the gentle cells around the eye that support the eye. And because of that, you'll actually get an inflammatory response on the surface of the eye as well too. And we've seen patients when they've actually acquired the appropriate treatments for their autoimmune conditions, it not only helps their general systemic health, but it also helps their eye symptoms as well too. Okay, what specific brands of drops would you recommend for dry eyes do mostly to not enough tears? How about Sequa? So this is again, such another good question. Um, so Sequa can help improve the quality and the amount of tears. Restasis can help the quantity of tears, but there are other things that can as well too. So the procedures that we talked about, all of those can help your eyes produce more tears as well too. I think the critical component to it is, is that having that open dialogue and communication with you and your eye care provider to say, what's, what's going to be the best first, first line for me with this? That's the first question. But the second question is, why? Why is this going to be the first best line treatment for me? Because that always has to be, has to occur. And although 18 years ago or in 2005, when I really first started understanding dry eye and we as a professional community started understanding dry eye better, we really didn't have those options. We just really had a few options and we tried them. If they worked great, if we, they didn't, we didn't have many more options at the time. We now have much more targeted treatments really based on why the dryness is occurring in the first place. All right, guys, great, great questions here. Donna, maybe next time we do one of these, we can just say, 
ask Dr. B about, and we can do the condition, and then we can literally make it an open forum um, on what we're actually talking about here as well, too. This is this is great. I'm glad we got a chance to um, get a lot of the questions answered. So what I'm going to be showing you here is literally, and you can see here on my in my video, you can actually see this instrument. And this instrument right here is called a slit lamp. So some of you may be very familiar with this because this is how we actually examine the eyes. And I sit right here on this side, the patient puts their head right here, and we actually look at the eyes through a magnified view. And that's actually what you're looking at through here. We have cameras on every single one of our slit lamps or special magnifiers. And that's what you're looking at here. You're looking at a magnified view of a patient's eye who has blepharitis. Well, you might be wondering, why am I showing you a magnified view of somebody's eye with blepharitis? It's because this is one of the masqueraders. This is one of the things that can actually elicit symptoms that are very similar to dry eye, but in actuality, it's not dry eye. Now, I'm going to show you this next slide. So again, some of these pictures are going to look really, really interesting for most of you, because if you've never seen a magnified view of the eyelid and the lid margin, all of this is very aggressive appearing. And what you can see here is on the left side, you're looking at it at a lower magnification. And on the right-hand side, I've just increased the magnification of my slit lamp. But you can see all this waxy buildup right here. This is what causes blepharitis. It's bacteria that actually forms these waxy deposits at the base of the eyelashes. And there's different ways that we can treat this. One way is we can put a medicated drop with an antibiotic and a steroid on the eye. So you literally use it just like a regular drop. But what I tell patients to do is instead of just wiping the excess drop away with a Kleenex, rub the excessive drop in the lash margin. And when they do that, they get the medicine right at the heart of what's causing a lot of these symptoms, which is right at the base of the eyelashes. There's other ways that we can treat patients with blepharitis, and that is to clean their eyelid margin with something called blephex or microblepharo exfoliation. And what this is, is this is a small spongy end right here at the top, and it spins really fast. It's a micrograde sponge. We wet it with a, with a special soap formulation. And then as you can see here in the video, we can clean all of that debris and discharge off of the lash margin. And oftentimes in the next several days, patients will feel a lot better from their symptoms. Now, there are another treatments for blepharitis, and that's special sprays that contain something called hypochlorous acid in it. Now, hypochlorous acid sounds relatively aggressive, but interestingly, this is very, very healthy for the eyes, and it's actually naturally found in the body. We have these little immune cells called neutrophils, and they actually already dump this hypochlorous acid onto bacteria when it encounters it to try and kill it already. So all we now have available is a bottle of hypochlorous spray that we can spray on a closed eye, and then you just rub it in the lash margin, and what it does is it kills that excessive bacteria. And these are just some examples of some commonly seen sprays. Now, some of you, if you have blepharitis, you may be using a lid scrub or a lid wipe that has some type of shampoo or soap or antibacterial properties in it. And for those of you that do that, that can actually eliminate some of that debris as well, too. Now, remember earlier how I told you that dry eye can cause blurry vision. This is going to really give you a visual that I hope you'll remember. So when you look on the picture on the left-hand side first, you can see the individual blinking. And you can see at first when they blink, this is the tear film of the patient. And you can see when you blink and that you have the tear film, it's all a constant color green. But then what almost immediately starts happening is you see these dark spots or these dark areas actually forming. These dark areas, when they form, it now means that that tear film's not smooth and it's not nice and consistent anymore. And because of that, we can't see clearly out of that. So again, because the tear film is lumpy, when light hits it, it scatters. And when it scatters, it actually makes it so that we don't see well. And that's why sometimes you have vision issues in addition to eye comfort issues with eye dryness. But what's also interesting is because this patient's basal level of tears, that tear film that's supposed to be on the eyes just at a really thin layer, because it's insufficient, 
this patient will probably have watery eyes as well too, because that second type of tear that we were talking about is actually going to now try and push as much of those really watery tears on the eyes to try and compensate for this lack of the primary type of tear. Well, guys, it is 120. And unfortunately, um, I now do have to get back to seeing, not unfortunately, that's a bad thing to say. I mean, unfortunately, we, we have to part ways here shortly, but I have to get back to seeing patients um, in my own office here. I'm going to open up the floor just to make sure that there's no other further questions and we'll get those answered. Is it good to use heating masks like Thermalon? As long as, I'm not familiar with the brand ther Thermalon, but as long as it's specifically designed for the eyes, you're okay. I don't, what I don't want you doing is I don't want you just picking up like heat pads that are built for, you know, sore arms or sore elbows or sore backs and putting it on the eye because that's unhygienic. Again, I want you, whatever heating device or heating system that you use for your eyes, I want it, I want to make sure it's specifically built for the eyes. All right. Any other questions about anything? Well, I will fast forward here just very quickly to the end of the presentation, just so you guys all have my email. And if there's any questions about anything that any of you guys have, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Otherwise, Donna, thank you so much for the invitation um, to really present here to what I felt was a really engaged audience. And I truly appreciate the questions. I always think that these conversations always work better when there are more questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Berzik. Your pre presentation was fantastic. I learned so much myself, and I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Before you leave, there'll be a, there will be a survey that will pop up, and I would appreciate if you fill out the survey for us. Uh, you can check our website for additional virtual uh, programs along with uh, in-person programs. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye.